welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, the tough-talking, advice-giving show by the not-really-mean, mean lady, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. And guess what? We're on episode 51. We are on the downside of our first 100 episodes. Thank you so much for your ratings and review and for all your email. I have so many things I want to talk about tonight. And (laughs) you guys, (laughs) there's so much email. So if I mention something that you've emailed me about tonight, it doesn't mean that this is the answer to your email. Honestly, I have so much email and I have a few guest podcasts to edit and go through and post. I could honestly talk for two hours, five days a week, just on the email that you guys have sent me on past shows. I'm going to try to wrap up some of the things that I've wanted to talk about. But again, if you are able to subscribe to the podcast from your app or whatever platform you listen on, rating and review is really important. And I haven't looked at getting sponsors for the show yet. That's a whole other kettle of fish. I now belong to a few different podcast communities. So I'm talking and schmoozing with other podcasters, including some editors who have given me some really good tips on editing. But honestly, my last podcast, the long one, 50B, I think it took me about eight hours to edit that. And a couple of editors have given me some good tips, but I still am not in the position to afford an editor. I hope when I get the podcast, Uh, the podcast website going. I can also start a Patreon account. If you like the podcast and want to see it continue, that'll be an option. But for now, ratings and reviews, rating and reviews, ratings and review. I also want to thank a few people on Twitter who took over reporting the cyberbully to Twitter. And Twitter actually sent a couple of them notice that they blocked the account that was doing the cyberbully. And one of the reasons why I mentioned having the attitude with that judge that day was just to say that I've had a 16 year relationship with judges and the American Bar Association and I've never done anything to be reprimanded and when Henry Panfell who was 72 years old in Youngstown Ohio and I have done nothing to decided to attack me and go after me he was relentless in sending emails to the Bar Association to my boss at the time and to law firms that we did business with and even the law firms that we typically oppose, we're lawyers. We have a professional relationship just because they're on the other side of the aisle doesn't mean that we don't have a good relationship with them. We worked with the same law firms all the time. We know the same law firms. So when Henry the Codger decided that he was going to send email anonymously about me to other law firms, these other lawyers wrote to my boss and said, I just want to let you know I'm not paying attention to this. This is crazy. I don't know what this is all about, but I want to let you know. And my boss let me know. And Henry also went on to the website and gave our law firm terrible review. Henry, we were doing malpractice defense at the time. You're not a doctor, dude. You don't have an IQ that would even come close to what you would need to be a doctor. So you're little negative reviews really don't mean anything. But what that showed, what the other attorneys calling my boss showed is that when you're attacking a lawyer, especially for no reason, lawyers will circle the wagons. And that's what I was trying to explain, not only about that judge, but that was the closest I ever came to getting into any kind of trouble with a judge or a another lawyer, anything like that. My my record is completely spotless. And I was stunned. I know that she thought that my stunned silence was an attitude, but one of the reasons why I told the story that I told before, if some faceless, nameless moron, I said, moron, who wants to line up and sue me? Some faceless, nameless moron writes to the American Bar Association and says, I don't like this lawyer's attitude. The American Bar Association is going to go, who the hell are you? I mean, it's like, 
They're not going to care, dude. They're really not going to care. We don't have a relationship. I don't represent you. Nobody cares. Okay. So I received several emails from people and some of people I've never heard of. I didn't know. Apparently this guy, George Z, his Twitter handle was tweets to make was the subject of some Facebook group. I don't even know what group it was. And they were saying, listen to this guy. He's attacking this woman on Twitter for no reason. He doesn't like her attitude. And people were using him as a joke. They were laughing. And apparently somebody in the group wanted to see what it was all about. And when he looked at the conversation and thought this guy was completely out of line, he reported the whole thing to Twitter. And he reported, not to me, but just to the people that followed the Jody Arias appeal and all that other stuff. He reported that Twitter had told him that they had taken action. And someone else on Twitter had sent me email and said that they reported him and that Twitter had taken action. So the score so far for those of you that are playing at home is Twitter has taken action against the cyber bullies on my side. My former boss took action against the cyber bullies on my side. The American Bar Association or the New York courts, whoever Henry Panfield reported me to, took no action, meaning they, they were on my side. Other law firms that we typically oppose, that we typically sit on the other side of the aisle to took no action except to tell my boss like this guy sounds crazy and the only people that sided with the cyber bullies was psychology today when I was in my most abusive relationship I was working as a cashier at a department store and I was 17 years old and he would come somebody would drop him off and we had a line of registers but he would come in and the guy was adorable and when he wasn't drinking. He had personality for days. He was funny. He was good looking. He had smoldering good looks. And when he was drinking, a lot of times he could still be fun. But it was that now and again time when he turned. And I could see, I could tell by the look in his eyes, that guy was turning. And I would think, oh my God. Now, when I was in the Bronx, I had this horrible, horrible boyfriend for about two weeks. His name was Timothy O'Gorman, and he was this little tiny shit. Most of the guys in our age group who were like 14, 15 years old were bigger than him. He was probably five for two, five for three. And most of the guys that I hung out with were you know, five foot 10, five foot 11, some were hitting six feet. Not Timothy. Timothy was a disgusting, horrible human being. And he was so abusive. It was horrific. And I had to be home at 10 o'clock. And if I wasn't home at 10 o'clock, I was in trouble. So we used to get some beer and we would go sit in the lots in the Bronx and we would drink. And now I'm not talking me and Timothy. I'm talking about me and a whole bunch of people. These are mostly kids that lived in the projects and Timothy lived in the projects. And usually one of the guys would walk me home and they would take turns and there was never any problem with any guy except freaking Timothy. And this one night it was me and it was girls and we would be walking through projects in the South Bronx in the 70s. It was very dangerous and it was getting to be late and we were, we were a ways from home. And we're all sitting around. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm looking at my watch and I'm like, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And my parents were completely unreasonable. My mother was completely unreasonable at the time. If I was two or three minutes past 10 p.m., I'd be in for a week. And I did not want to stay in for a week. So I said, Timothy was the guy that was going to walk me home supposedly this night. And I said to him, we have to go. And he would be, he was one of these guys where he would sometimes be nice to me and sometimes be mean to me. And we had had our little two week romance, which was horrible and it was over, but he would always make this big deal about me. Like I had done something to him. And I think that's why I respond very badly to people even now. And I've tried to look Timothy up and I hope he's dead. I honestly do. Because what happened this night was he had been abusive to me. He had said a bunch of awful, awful things to me. And I'm a 14 year old girl. 
And he was my second boyfriend. And my first boyfriend was no prize either. But Timothy was much worse. He was verbally abusive. He was emotionally abusive. And he was physically abusive. And he was also stalkerish. And he was also very taunting. And people were afraid of him, even though he was a little shit because he had taken martial arts or some bullshit like that. So there's all these girls sitting around and I was like, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And he's like, well, go, go. And I didn't want to walk through the lots by myself. And I certainly didn't want to come out of the lots and walk through the projects by myself. Although I'd walked through the projects many nights by myself and no one ever bothered me. But he goes, when we finish the beer. And I looked and I'm like, we have like four big bottles of beer. So he took one of the bottles, another of the girls took another of the bottles, and I think a third girl took, I think a second girl took one of the bottles. And the girls were all looking like, let's polish off these bottles of beer. And the fourth, I started to take it, but then I poured it out. And he, Timothy, picked me up by my shoulders. Now we're about the same size in both height and weight. But he picks me up by my shoulders and knees me in the solar plexus. And I hit the floor. And I was writhing in pain. And I had to go to the hospital. And I'll tell you, if anything like this had happened to my daughter, even one of my sons, there would have been hell and damnation down on this family. My family, this was their response to me. What did you do to him? Okay, so that's why people who grow up in abusive households and then have abusive relationships don't know that it's not okay or that it's not their fault. And it still happens. If anybody thinks that abusive relationships don't happen, they continue on to this day. Now, to get back to my 17 year old boyfriend. He was now like Timothy. Timothy wouldn't have turned anyone's head ever. He was a little nebbish bookworm, little, in fact, he worked in a bookstore. Little shit. The guy, when I was 17, he was tall, he was 5'11, and he wasn't done growing because he was 17. He had smoldering good looks. He didn't have the angry look that a lot of people that, that a lot of guys that have smoldering good looks have. But when he would come to my department store, the cashiers on the front line, they're mostly young girls around my age. They would go to me, oh my God, your boyfriend is so cute. And I would think, I know, I know he is. He didn't cheat on me for almost a year. And when he did, he was drunk. <laughs> And I did what a lot of women do and still do to this day, which is horrible, ladies, horrible, horrible, horrible. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I didn't know that I didn't know. I didn't know any better. I found out from the guy who's going to be my first husband that my boyfriend, who I had broken up with, I have to admit, we were not together. He was on the beach making out with this girl named Bridget. And the ironic thing was, was that the guy that would be my first husband had a crush on Bridget at some point. He used to have crushes on girls for 15 minutes and that was it. But I knew that at some point he had a crush on Bridget. And I couldn't tell if he was telling me this because he wanted to get together with Bridget or what, like, or me. I, I had no idea what was going on here, but that he was the one who told me about it. So this is what I did, ladies. And you can, you know, I don't know if guys do this. If you're a guy and you're listening and you've done this, please let me know because I'd really like to hear the story from a guy and not the guy in this story, the guy who would be the woman in this story. When he and I got back together, you know where I went the first time? The first afternoon that I was back with Mr. Banana Head? To the store where Bridget worked. Because Bridget was, guess what? A front-end cashier, not in the same place I was. I was in a department store. She was in a grocery store. And I made sure that Bridget saw that we were together. <laughs> I showed her, didn't I? <laughs> oh, Bridget's probably happily married somewhere to some great guy. <laughs> Bridget had lost her mind for New York Minute and then she 
scrambled and got it back into her head. I wish she had taken the first, my first husband off her hands, off my hands. <laughs> I wish she had taken my first husband off my hands. So I went from that relationship into relationship with my first husband. And I was in abusive relationships all through my teenage years. But when my boyfriend would show up at my job and all the girls would swoon, that's what I'd be thinking of when I'd be thinking about breaking up with him. I'd be thinking, oh, you know, some girl's going to snatch this guy up because why? Oh, gee, let me see. He's abusive. He has an alcohol problem. He doesn't work. And he has a felony with a seven to 10 year prison term hanging over his head. And he has a rap sheet as long as my arm or longer than my arm. And for some reason, this is the prize I wanted to hold on to because I didn't know that I didn't know. And I didn't know that there were guys who didn't beat you up because every teenage boyfriend I had was like that. But I found out many years later from guys that I had gone to grammar school and high school with that they liked me, but they were good boys and they, and I like bad boys. And it wasn't that I like bad boys. It was that I had grown up with a certain template of this is who you could be with. Now, I was watching a show where they had this so-called expert on a relationship expert. And she was saying, all couples argue. And if you don't argue, there's something wrong. And I have to say, that's not true. Michael and I never argued. And yes, part of it was his ADHD. But another part of it was we were not sweating the small stuff. But a guy should, even if you argue... When I've done couples counseling, the couples that have succeeded are couples who come to me with communication issues. Getting back out there is not a dating book. It's a whole template of healthy relationships and healthy communication. And I put a section in the new workbook, the new Getting Past Your Past workbook about healthy communication. Now, none of us are taught how to speak to each other, but there is a healthy way to speak and a not healthy way to speak. And when I first met Michael, he had no therapy experience. He'd never been in therapy. He was just guy bopping along. And we ironed that out in the first year of the relationship. And then we went on our way. One of the things that I've talked about is we minimized areas where other couples that I've seen over the years run into trouble. We didn't have smartphones when we met, but he worked in a blue collar industry with all guys. I'd always had guy friends and I'd always had guy work friends. In his past was a woman that he thought he was in love with. He told me later that after he fell in love with me, he realized that he had not really been in love with her. She was the woman he felt the strongest about before he met me. And he was a long distance trucker and she lived in Washington state and he felt he met her and he fell in love with her and he was going to move out there. So he moved home to Massachusetts to sell his truck and then he flew out there. And when he flew out there, he finds that she's living with her old boyfriend. So he was devastated. And he told me this early on, like first or second date, because we talked about previous relationships and stuff. So when we moved in together. I was trying to get in touch with the guy from Italy to let him know that I'm moving in with my boyfriend and probably not a good idea for you to be calling the house and we had not had a committed relationship so he knew I was seeing other people I assume he was seeing other people we didn't talk about it anyway that's the way that it was but he called the house because I had had my old number forwarded to the new house and Michael was apoplectic about the fact that this guy had called the house but he traveled all the time and it had been hard for me to get in touch with him now people in Europe had cell phones long before they had them in the United States but I still couldn't get in touch with him because he traveled a lot especially Africa where he represented a lot of athletes in Africa plucked them up if they were athletically inclined and he would take them back to Italy and he would train them well not he wouldn't train them but he would manage them and then he would get them in touch with other trainers. But Michael was apoplectic. And I said to him, look, I I've never cheated on anyone. So either trust me or don't. And I knew that he was, I knew he had this issue with this woman from Washington State. And I said to him, I'm not her. Don't paint me with that broader brush because it's not going to happen. Now, he and I jumped on and off each other's computers all the time. We had each other's passwords. And then when we got cell phones, we had each other's passwords to the cell phone. There was never any concern that either one of us were cheating because we didn't do that. But 
if you are in a relationship where somebody's accusing you of cheating or you have to check somebody's phone because you think they're cheating, there's something wrong here. Getting back out there is not a dating book. It talks about healthy relationships and healthy communication. And it doesn't say this in that book because I didn't see it a lot in my practice or in different stories that people told me at the time. But if you're in a committed relationship with somebody, either you trust each other or you have each other's passwords or both. And I had male friends and I told him that. I said, I have guy friends. And if you can't get used to that, then we're going to have an issue. I said, I know you don't have female friends and maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a female friend or you would think that maybe you would be attracted to your female friend. I don't know what your issue is here, but it's not going to spill over into my male friends because I'm not giving up my male friends. And whenever I was out to dinner with one of them or I was working overnight, I worked overnight with John all the time. And I know that Michael, I know that Michael would be like gritting his teeth like how was your night with John (laughs) but it was like John had this uh, John had this attraction to women that were you know supermodel good looks (laughs) I was like (laughs) I had five kids at home had gay I quit smoking I had gained a lot of weight John wasn't interested in me oh yeah so There's this harried, crazy lady that he works with. I mean, we're good friends. We're still friends. If he called me up and said, I need a favor, I I would give him whatever favor he needed. I don't have any money, John, so don't ask. But if it would have kept up, we would have been over. There's no room for jealousy in healthy relationships. And if there's jealousy, if there's let me see your phone, if you don't trust each other, get out of the relationship. Work on your issues. Figure it out. If you're with somebody who doesn't trust you, figure out do they have a reason to not trust you? If they do, you got to fix that. If they don't, you got to tell them. And I know I've talked about this on other podcasts. I told Michael, I said, dude, (laughs) I didn't say dude. I told Michael. I'm not cheating on you because I don't want two men in my life. And he looked at me like I had just hit him with a wet fish. And he said, really, hon? Really? That's it? That's the reason why you wouldn't cheat on me? And I said, well, what what do you want? And he said, I want you to say you wouldn't cheat on me because you love me. And I said, but what happens when the day comes when I'm so angry with you? And this never, ever happens. So he said, what happens if... The day comes where I'm so angry at you that I don't feel love for you. Where does that leave my fidelity? I said, with me not wanting two guys in my life, because really, to me, what a nightmare. Two guys? I was like, oh my Lord, I could barely handle one. But honestly, I said, that's my own parameters. I don't want two guys in my life. And I don't want overlapping guys. I said, if we break up, I want some time to myself. I said, I don't need a man to leave this relationship if it's not working for me. I said, if this relationship isn't working for me, I'm out the door. I don't need a boyfriend to go out the door. So I said, my reasoning is a lot stronger than your reasoning as to why I wouldn't cheat. So anyway, in healthy relationships, you either trust each other or you don't. And if you trust each other, there's no reason if you're in a serious committed relationship, especially if you're married or living together, you should have each other's passwords to the phone. And there should be no issue with that. Phone, text, email, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever the hell. I mean, I didn't need Michael's password for anything other than jumping on his computer and fixing it now and again because he was always breaking the thing. And he didn't really need my password, but we had it and we were trustworthy. And so it became a non-issue. Anyway, one of the signs of abuse is this suspicion. If somebody is accusing you of cheating and you're not cheating, be very, very careful. And if you have a relationship with somebody and you don't trust them, what are you doing in the relationship? And I'm going to talk to the ladies for a minute. I know that there are women who are abusive. I know this absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But the majority of abusive relationships are men are the abusers and women are the abused. And it's mostly due to difference in size or whatever. So this isn't some hysterical woman thing. 
but I want to talk to the ladies for a minute. If you have a really good looking boyfriend, that's no reason to stay. My 17 year old boyfriend was better looking than most guys I've ever been with. He was gorgeous. And when he wasn't drinking, he was fun. And I wouldn't say he was a narcissist. The guy had many, many issues. He had grown up in a very violent, alcoholic home and he became just like his father. But his father was a mean, mean man, even when he wasn't drinking. And my boyfriend wanted, as the oldest child, wanted to prove to his father and his uncles, his father's brothers, that he was a man. And this is how they did it. Drink and fight, drink and fight, drink and fight, beat up women, drink and fight, drink and fight, go to jail, beat up women, beat up cops, beat up this, beat up that. But honestly, I would say that he didn't really have it in him. If he wasn't full of alcohol, he didn't have it in him. And I think that that insecurity, that he really wasn't the mean old guy that his father was, I think that ate at him. I really do. And as a 17 year old girl, I felt sorry for him. I felt sorry for him. I saw what that family went through. I saw how his father and then his uncle terrorized his mother and the kids. I know that his mother and father would drink and leave those kids up on a farm because his father was a farm worker and his mother would do work on the farm too. They would get drunk and fight and drunk and fight and leave those kids. And the youngest was really young. There was five kids. He was the oldest. My boyfriend was the oldest. And I think there was seven years between him and his youngest sibling. And he was 17 when I met him. So this all went on. The stories that he was telling me went on before he was 17. So they would leave those kids up at the farm with no food, nothing. And he told me that he stole dog food from the neighbors and fried it up for his siblings like it was hash. And they all ate it. He told me this story. As somebody who always had a meal to eat, I always had a meal. I always had clean clothes. I always had a clean house. I always had crazy parents, but nothing like that. Both of my parents were an alcoholic. I, my mother was the physical crazy codependent, but I always had clean clothes. I always had food in my stomach. I always had a clean house. I never had to worry about where the hell my parents were. And I certainly wasn't responsible for four younger siblings. Never. None of that ever happened to me. So when he told me these stories, I felt sorry for him. Now I'll tell you, When I met my birth mother when I was in my 30s and she was telling me about her abusive boyfriends and I was looking at her like she was out of her mind, she said to me, I felt sorry. I felt sorry. She said, I always felt sorry. And I swear I wanted to throttle her because I want to say, lady, you had six kids. You abuse my brother to within an inch of his life. I have another brother that you haven't even told me about. And my sister died of SIDS. And you felt sorry for your boyfriends? Honestly, I wanted to throttle her. But at the same time, I remember thinking back as a 17-year-old girl and feeling sorry for my boyfriend. And all of that came into play whenever we would break up. And whenever we would break up and he would do his abuser's remorse and I'm so sorry and he'd be crying, all of that would come into play. But I can tell you that when he hit me and he stabbed me and he choked me and he did all kinds of things to me, things that I haven't talked about on the podcast and I never will, but people who have been in boot camps with me, I've heard some of the more serious abuse and I'm not talking about the stabbing the attempted murder. I'm talking about something even worse than that. But my mother had me when I was 26 and the boyfriends that she was talking about, she was in her thirties and she had little kids and she had divorced my brother's father. But when I had my kids in my thirties, guys didn't get near them. They didn't get near them. I dated guys. They didn't know where I lived. 
when women tell me that they have guys picking them up at home for the first date and they've got little kids at home, I'm like, are you crazy? People get killed like that. Nobody knew where I lived with my kids. Nobody. And there were only three men that I ever introduced all of my kids to. And I had another boyfriend that I used to have lunch with. One of the Bobsy twins that I talked about in one of the other podcasts. One of the Bobsy twins worked second shift. So when I was on call in technical support, I would work from home because I was up all night. And my youngest was in kindergarten. So I used to pick him up at noontime and we would have lunch with my boyfriend. But my other two kids never met him. So it was only three guys. One was a serious boyfriend very early on. The other one was the guy that I was with for almost five years. And the other one was Michael. All the other guys, my kids never met. My kids didn't even know about most of them. And most of the time it was, I'll go to your house. I'll meet you there. I could be seeing a guy for weeks and he still wasn't picking me up at my house. I protected my kids. I protected my kids like a mama bear. So when my mother said, Oh, I felt sorry. I truly wanted to throttle her. I want to say, who's sorry now after I throttled her? But I didn't. I just sat there and went, oh my God, I cannot believe that this woman actually gave birth to me. I'm such a magnificent person compared to her. Anyway, phew. Okay, so if somebody calls you a name, if somebody accuses you of cheating, these, this is abuse. These are gateways to abuse. This is how it starts. If you grab somebody's phone and then they push you or shove you or threaten you, that's abusive. It needs to end. Abuse is not okay. It's never okay. Don't allow any of it. It, Today, it's a shove. Tomorrow, it's a punch. Tomorrow, it's a slap and then it's a punch. I have spoken to girls in high school. I've gone to high school and I've done speeches on leaving abusive relationships. You have to get the word out to girls to let them know that abuse is not okay. Being called names is not okay. Being pushed is not okay. It's just not okay. Being accused of infidelity when you're not doing anything is not okay. And girls, let me tell you, if all the other girls in the world think that your boyfriend is a gorgeous piece of wonderfulness, let them have him if he abuses you in any way. I know that there were several factors that went into me staying with this guy. First of all, his truly heartfelt stories about some of the stuff he'd went through. His growing up was truly truly not a good situation and him trying to prove himself to be a man to his father who had shown him everything wrong that this is what you have to do to become a man I felt sorry for him don't feel sorry for a guy who can drink and then abuse you don't it's not worth it and it's not your fault. Whatever he does is not your fault. I don't care how good looking he is. I don't care how cute he is. I don't care how funny he is. Don't be in that relationship because abusive relationships don't start off horrible because if they did, none of us would stay in abusive relationships. The gaslighting is real. They start to work on you. They start to berate you. They start to tell you how terrible you are. They start to screw with your head. And I can tell you that that guy, my 17-year-old boyfriend, he never gaslighted me. He just got pissed drunk and would attack me like I had tried to kill his mother. I mean, that's really the viciousness that he would come after me with. And he would have all these things in his head. The night that they took him out of the place in Georgia, he was looking for my manager. He was listening to me talk about a night at work. I was talking about my manager who was a guy named Mike. I was like 17. Mike was like 25. He was a nice looking young guy. But I was telling this story to my boyfriend one night about something that happened to me at work and I was mentioning my manager in passing. And then the next thing I know is he's in my job turning the place upside down looking for my manager to kill him. 
because he would get that jealousy thing going when he was drunk and stewing. One of the Marx Brothers movies, I think it was Night at the Opera, Groucho Marx calls up for room service and, and he says, you have any stewed prunes? And they say yes. And he says, well, give him black coffee. That'll just open them up. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know why that just hit me. But my boyfriend would get drunk and stew in different things that I had said that were perfectly innocent, had nothing to do with anything. And then I'm defending some crazy thing that he latched on to. That I said when I was sober that he never questioned me at the time. And then when he's drunk, he's rip roaring crazy and coming after me. If that has happened to you even once, get out. It doesn't get any better. It gets worse. When I was in Georgia with him, long way away from my family, he choked me until I passed out. He tried to run me over with my own car. He choked me and left me in a puddle while it was raining and I woke up choking on the puddle water. He did a few other things and then he tore up the place where I worked the last night that we were in Georgia and I came back. My parents paid for me to come back. But they had already sent me the money. But Big Mouth over here had to tell him this. That's another thing don't do. Don't don't tell abusive people that you're planning on leaving. That's the most dangerous time. Just get out. I wanted him to feel bad. I said, I'm going back to New York. And he goes, well, I'll go back too. And I said, I'm going back to the Bronx. You'll never find me. And that's when he went completely crazy. So when I went to work that night, he got drunk. And then he came in and wrecked place. And then the next thing you know, he's being extradited back to New York because it was an open warrant because he had jumped bail and the state of New York is paying for him to go back and I'm flying back by myself. Gee, wasn't that a happy little scene I had painted for myself? Anyway, abuse starts with some jealousy. Abuse starts with some ridiculousness. Abuse starts with a push and it definitely starts with name calling. I don't care who you are or what the name is. Don't Be in a relationship with anybody, male or female, who calls you a name. And I don't care if if you're young, if you're old, if you're if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you are in a a heterosexual relationship, a homosexual relationship, a bisexual relationship. I don't care. Nobody should ever be calling anyone a name ever. It's not okay. Language is important. I just spent a year revamping the GPYP, GPYB affirmation material because language is important. Words are important. Names are important. This goes back to the cyber bullies. You're not calling me names and you're not ganging up on me. And if I call you an idiot because you attacked me, too bad, so sad, you sad little pitiful man, tough tooties. Suck it up and get off my Twitter feed, you moron. But names between intimates should never, ever, ever be flung about. Never. I just released the GPYP Power Affirmations booklet level two. It is on the gettingpassyourbreakup.com website. Please go there. Please buy it and learn about the positive and negative way of speaking. And don't allow it in your relationships. Abusive relationships don't start with a punch in the mouth. And there's absolutely no reason why you need to put up with it in any way, shape, or form. I don't care if you're a man. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're young. I don't care if you're old. And if anybody told you that abuse is your fault and you're the victim, no, 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 no. Not okay. Not okay. Not okay. It's not. It's not. It's not. You didn't know that you didn't know. Get out. Get out. Get out. You know now. Get out. Phew. Anyway, take care. Please continue with the cards and letters. Please rate and review, rate and review, rate and review. It's really, really important for this podcast. I appreciate it so much. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Take care, everybody. 